Uh, my name's David Barnes, I'm from Monash University. I've just moved to Monash and I'm working in Monash Biomedical Imaging. Uh, my background is actually radio astronomy, so what I actually do is I'm a signal processing person and a visualisation programmer. Um, and what I'm going to talk to you today about is uh, taking existing desktop OpenGL code and getting it working on your iPhone or your iPad. Um, and this talk is possible because it's something I've, I've done over the last six months. I actually wanted to do it about three years ago, at starting with WWDC 2008, but often it's a matter of finding time to, to actually uh, do these things. Uh, <clears throat> so why would you want to do this? Uh, there's about three reasons, and two of these look quite similar to each other. The first thing is that there's potentially lots and lots of legacy code. So in my case, um, one of the things I've done over the last few years is uh, collect a previous person in my job's code, um, which is all a whole bunch of like 50 or 100 different programs to do different things, and sort of coalesced it into a user library so that the scientists could start writing their own code. It's a visualization library. It's not, a, it's not on the level of VTK. Um, it doesn't scare people with C++ and objects. It's nice friendly C that you can use from Fortran and C and Python. Um, but there's lots of legacy code here, and I don't want to rewrite it to enable the scientists to start doing their visualization on their mobile device. So it's also a good thing to be able to deliver existing apps on, onto the mobile platform. Um, it's what people like, but it's actually there are actually many good arguments for uh, communication, at least in science, uh, in being able to um, share visualizations um, in something so almost like a piece of paper, rather than a heavy laptop or a workstation that you tend not to pick up. And um, the third point is to deliver existing apps on a touch screen. And you might say that sounds a bit like a mobile device, but th these are two very different things. The mobile device lets you show it around and carry it easily and so on. The touch interface gives you a new way of working with your data. Um, and I'll just give you a quick example of how the touch interface can change the way you have to work. We do 3D um, projection, and when you're doing uh, OpenGL, you might end up doing some 3D coding where you use red-blue glasses or something more sophisticated. On the iPad, red-blue glasses are pretty easy to use. Um, but you discover that as soon as you do this, when you touch the screen with your finger, your brain gets a little confused because your finger should be obscuring stuff, but it's not. Or your finger is obscuring stuff that should be in, that were, was in front of it until you put your finger there. This doesn't happen with a mouse on a flat screen. So there are interesting paradigm changes, um, even if you just want to use the finger as a mouse. Um, and some of these paradigm changes are good. It gives you more engagement with the data or more engagement with the thing you're doing. So here's an example. This is a, if you had red-blue glasses with you, you'd um, probably be out of luck because the projectors aren't brilliant, but um, this is a skull volume rendered on an iPad, um, in fact in the iPad simulator in this case, uh, with bog standard OpenGL, so this is uh, OpenGL, desktop OpenGL 1.4 sort of code, uh, with the fixed function pipeline moved over to OpenGL ES 1.1, which is a pretty easy uh, shift, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, but I'm not just going to talk about the OpenGL part of the shift. You've got to move from whatever controller you've been using for your desktop display through to view controllers. So I'll say a little bit about them as well. And you now have this opportunity to, to, to build a new interface very easily. Um, so, And my, my background also is, in fact, I'm a Unix programmer, so I tend not to write user interfaces. I tend to do a lot of work at the command line. And if I have to write a user interface, I might actually write it in OpenGL rather than have to learn some other arcane system of callbacks or buttons or widgets. Uh, but on the iPhone, it's so easy that um, it was a, it's actually the easiest way for me to put an interface around my apps is to, is to actually move the app, move the OpenGL to the iOS device, and then use its beautiful user interface. And the overall message, if you, uh, if you leave early or fall asleep or... Um, just uh, just want the pricey, then it's, it's, it's this, that existing OpenGL code can mostly be reused if you're prepared to use fixed function pipeline. Just to um, crystallize that for you, so OpenGL Open ES 1.1 is a fixed function pipeline. You don't have to think about how you draw geometry. You don't have to think about how you shade pixels on the screen. All you have to think about is geometry what color material your geometry is made of, and if you like, what lights you're going to light it with. 
If you go to OpenGL ES2, you need to start writing shaders, and shaders are the things that turn geometry into pixels on the screen. And I'm not going to talk about that today at all. Um, so most of the existing drawing code can be reused, but you have to move from what's called direct mode GL, uh, which is you s in, literally in your code you say, I'm going to draw some quads for, for vertex uh, patches, uh, and here are their vertices, now draw it. That's direct mode. Um, in OpenGLES, that is not there. You have to say, here's an array of vertices. Please draw them as, a qu as quads. Um, so that's a very, very simple change. You don't have to do anything new in your code. You don't have to do any more calculations. You just have to rearrange your code a bit and call some different functions. But it can all be done in the same place. You literally pull code out, put some new stuff in. looks pretty similar. All of your C-based model store and management code can be reused in OS. In, in iOS. Did I put, yeah, I did put my, good. Um, so um, many of you will know this, but some might not. You can literally include C code in Objective C methods or Objective C um, files, and it'll compile just fine as long as you haven't used any bizarre system library that's only on Mac or Linux but not on iOS. Uh, this extends to a lot of the operating system because iOS is BSD based, Unix based. Uh, the model view controller is the key to success here. So what you have to do, and I'm going to walk you through it, is you have to separate your drawing code, so your sort of view, from what you use to control the user's interaction with that and how you store the model. The model almost stays the same. As I say, you must, if you're doing OpenGL, you'll have a model that you draw when it comes time to draw the screen or draw the geometry. You refer to your model data, however you've stored it, and you create drawing commands from that. And so that model can pretty much stay the same. All we're going to work on is the view and the controller. And my, uh, my recommendation is, if you want to do this, get it working with the fixed function first, uh, and then transition to the programmable pipeline. Um, the programmable pipeline gets you a lot more flexibility in what cool stuff you can do, which is, I think, important for gaming. But my perspective is very much helping a scientist look at their data. And, and honestly, um, I don't necessarily need a programmable shader pipeline to do that. There are circumstances where I do. For example, a, a shader pipeline of, that you've written yourself can get you a whole lot more performance in volume rendering or isosurface extraction. But that's sort of about it. I don't need smoke, and I don't need um, shadows or input from the camera, let's say. So the objective is to go from this to this. And the, the sort of test case I'm talking about is the library that we developed that then lets a user make an application like this in about 20 lines of C code. Um, sorry if I'm ignoring the people on this side. I'm just confused with two screens, and they're sort of one in front of the other. This one's easier for me. Uh, so on the left is uh, an S2. It's called S2plot, this library. Uh, an S2plot application running on the desktop, and it could be running on a Mac, it could be running on a Linux box, and in the past we had it running on Sigwin, but I just couldn't be bothered with that. Uh, it could be revived if we had a good use case. And on the right-hand side, right, yes, is an iPad running the same code. So with the work I've done, the code, the main C code that produced that plot was quite literally cut and paste, pasted, cut and pasted? cut and pasted into a um, into the uh, application did finish launching method of the application delegate. So the outline of, of what I'll talk about is um, here. So I'm going to briefly talk about OpenGL and GLUT. I hope that, look, I mean, there'll be, there may be people here who haven't done much OpenGL, but OpenGL and GLUT is sort of the standard desktop paradigm for doing OpenGL. At least it has been. There are new ones. Uh, I'll talk a bit about OpenGLS, GLES, and UIView and UIView controller. And then there's sort of four things you have to do if you want to do this. You need to separate your code into drawing, control, and other code. Uh, in my case, this was probably the biggest job because of the way the library had been amalgamated from so many bits and pieces of code in the first place. Uh, I would not say it was a good piece of software design, but that's not my skill. Um, migrate the GL code from GL to GLES 1.1, generally pretty easy. If you want to go to version, if you want to go to ES2, you've got a bit more work to do, because ES2 doesn't give you the matrix stack or 
sorry, the, ma the model view or projection stack, and it doesn't give you a fixed function pipeline at all. Um, and then uh, you need to replace GLUT control. You can't use, there's no GLUT on the iOS. You have to commit to the UI view controller. And then you need to redesign GLUT input. And this is the, um, this is the thinking part, is how do I now allow the user to interact with the geometry uh, in, um, in a naturally similar way so they can pick this up and use it like they use the desktop app, but also involving some of the paradigms they'll know from using other iOS apps. So you'd like pinch zoom, for example, if you're viewing a 3D model. Okay, um, OpenGL and GLUT. OpenGL, uh, accelerated graphics uh, hardware these days is quite extraordinary. Your graphics card is about 100 to 1,000 times more powerful than the CPU. Um, OpenGL on your desktop is generally a direct mode OpenGL. That was where you say, I mean, it has array operations as well, the non-direct mode, but it generally in, historically has been used as begin triangles, here's some vertices, now draw them. Uh, and GLUT is the GL utility toolkit, and this is uh, what lets you set up Windows um, in an operating system independent manner. Um, it has the main event loop. That's quite critical. So the GLUT, when you write a GLUT program, you hand control over to the GLUT event loop, which is an internal function in the library. And the only way you get control back to your user, the way you get program flow back to your user code is through callbacks. Um, think delegates. Um, and uh, GLUT can also provide menus and objects. For example, it has a, there's a call to draw a teapot, very handy. Uh, I've been to enough talks today that drew kittens. I don't know of a GLUT call to draw a kitten, but uh, perhaps a teapot warped with a particular shader could be made to look like a kitten. Uh, the pairing of GL and GLUT is entrenched in desktop GL. R I mean, recently there have been you know, things like VTK and QT. QT, I think it's QT Designer is quite good if you want to build OpenGL apps these days. Um, and here's, here's a snippet of code, so I can't give this talk without showing some code. Uh, whoa, it's a little bit small, sorry. Um, this, is, this is the second smallest one, I hope. So the code at the top is GLUT code, which sets up a window and um, gets the display going and uh, registers the final line there, GLUT display function display, is registering a callback. And whenever GLUT needs to redraw the display, it'll call that function, and that's where you can do your drawing code. Somewhere down, further down, there's some GL code. This is mostly GL code to set up the view. There's not actually any geometry drawn here. And there's two blue calls, which are glue, uh, GL utility calls. So um, we'll come back to this in a minute. How is it going to be different if we're using an iOS device? Uh, in this case, we have OpenGL ES. ES stands for Embedded Systems or Exceptionally Skillful. Uh, I think it's Embedded Systems. Um, it's streamlined OpenGL with the bloat removed. Because in OpenGL on the desktop, there's, about, there's often about four or five ways to draw, some, draw one type of thing. Uh, in, in OpenGL ES, they strive for one way to draw everything, in fact. Uh, quads are drawn the same way as triangles, are drawn the same way as uh, big complicated meshes. Um, it's this, you, you make a, a buffer on the card, store your data there and draw it. Uh, and then the UI view controller, uh, which most of you have hopefully heard of, um, manages the view. So it's like a replacement for GLUT. Think of it as the thing that sets up your window size and um, makes sure it's filling the screen and tells the tells your program when to do some drawing, and it responds to user interface events and updates the model and or the view. So these are the pathway to 3D on iOS. And here's a snippet of GLES and UI view controller code, uh, which is exactly the same as the one I just showed you for GLUT and GL, uh, except the orange code is different. We don't use GLUT anymore. We use uh, the, the OpenGL context that the standard uh, Xcode iOS OpenGL ES application uh, project gives you. So I don't need to do anything here. I don't need to register display callbacks. I don't need to tell it what resolution, what size window I want. That doesn't make sense on the iOS paradigm. Um, and then the rest of the code here is the same. The blue functions have changed because unfortunately on the iPhone there's no GL utility toolkit. There's no glue. So you have to write your own. 
Um, I have a little some tips at the end uh, that tell you that you can go and look at uh, the Mesa uh, code. So Mesa is an old software version of OpenGL, and they had software. They have open source. It's not it's not free source. It's open source though. Open source versions of uh, some of these functions that you can build your own versions from. I'm going to try and make these slides available, even though we're recording the session. I actually think the slides are a bit more useful because you can go through them quickly and they'll be in um, decent quality. So don't, please don't try and copy these down. So uh, a Unix nerd that I am, I thought I should do a diff. Here's a summary of the differences between uh, the iOS and the desktop snippet. The GL state code is common. In fact, that almost doesn't, almost doesn't matter if you're going to use OpenGL ES2. The initialization and control code is different. So we've replaced glut functions with some of the structure of our uh, GL view and view controller. And the utility functions are missing. But everything else, if you have C code that manages a data model or you have C++ code that um, applies changes to that data model in response to user interactions, and that's all nicely uh, classed up with methods you can call when the appropriate thing happens, that code can all stay the same. You can literally include it in your, in your code, or you can um, add the, fi the existing files to your project. So the first step is to uh, take your existing code that you want to move across and separate it out into the bits that are distinguished by that previous slide. So you need to distinguish GL drawing code from glue utility functions, from init and control code, uh, and user model code. And this is a good thing to do anyway. And um, as I said, this was sort of the biggest job I had, because I had this code base that had sort of accumulated from all sorts of different directions. And uh, this is probably what I should have done at the start, if I was writing this from scratch with a good software engineering viewpoint. Um, uh, no one's here to argue that I should have written it in C++, please. Uh, so the case study I'm using is S2Plot. I've said a little bit about this already. Uh, it uses desktop GL and GLUT, and it's all direct mode, historically. Uh, and it uses a callback system for dynamic content. So the user who had to hand over control to, uh, to GLUT main loop um, would still like to be able to change their geometry. Like maybe it's a time evolving simulation. So we provide a callback system, and the GLUT main loop which we registered a display callback, well, the display callback internal to the S2 plot library can then call all of the callbacks that the user has registered. And it's um, embarrassingly, when I started this, it was monolithic. It was pretty much one source file, <coughs> all of this. And just keep in mind, so S2 plot is about 230 user level functions. It was about 20,000 lines of code um, and um, messy, but functional. But an, an S2 plot application, a user application, can just be 20 lines of code. Um, most of the things I'll show, most of the images I'll show you a bit later on, that's the teaser to make you stay, um, are like 20 to 30 lines of code. And all, most of that is loading data. That's the bane of visualization, in fact, is loading data. So here's uh, my best diagram of the original state of my code. Um, it was all over the place. Um, and some of it did indeed look like it was upside down and inside out. So I went through and tidied it. Um, this is the most boring part of the job, is to tidy it all up. Because when you do this, you discover there's all sorts of interdependencies that you hadn't thought about. So you work through these. And then you get to this point where you've now actually split things apart. So what I've got now is an s2plot.c file that has no OpenGL in it. But it has all of my data structures, all of my user functions. Because my user functions don't call OpenGL. Like the user has a function to plot x, y points. That doesn't call OpenGL. That does something to the model, which is the geometry. So all that code is in s2plot.c. It's the bulk of the code. And I can just build that on an iPhone. So I've done my model now. And now I've got to work on these bottom bits. I've got to handle the fact that I've got direct mode OpenGL. I need to change that to. Uh, non-direct mode, array mode, I think it's called. And I've got a little bit of work to do with glue down here. So there's only about three or four functions I use from glue, so that's OK. We can go to the Mesa code for inspiration on um, how I can do that. And then I've got to deal with the transfer from GLUT through to um, view controllers. 
So the migration is pretty easy. You can keep all of your GL state code in, in most of it. Uh, because we're going to ES 1.1, you can use your projection and model view matrices as you always have in OpenGL. But you need to rewrite your direct mode draw code. This is not a bad thing, because you can still use that direct mode draw code back on the desktop, because almost all OpenGL desktop implementations support that now. And they're even, helpfully, starting to not use this extension here on the function names, which, is, which was used early on where the vendors gave you an extension to load so you could use these functions. So if I had all the time in the world, this uh, direct mode draw code would then propagate back into um, the desktop version. So here's a direct mode snippet, uh, which is drawing some triangles. It's working on my data structure, which um, I don't want to draw all the triangles. I've got a structure of triangles. They have three vertices and a color. Uh, and normals. And I don't want to draw all of them. I'm only drawing some of them, which is this test on the third line. Um, and then once I know which one I want to draw, I call normals to say, here are the normal, here's a normal, here's a color, here's a vertex. I do that three times for each triangle. And then I call end, and all the triangles get drawn. Um, the array mode version is longer in this case because my data structure was never written to correspond to the idea that I might just want to blast arrays of vertexes or vertices or colors or whatever straight to the card. Uh, and in this case, there's a lot more work to do because now I've got to set up three arrays to put my things into. I've got to go through my list of structures again, copy the values into the arrays, and then this is the drawing code. So it looks a little more heavyweight, but uh, if I were to go back now and rewrite my structures, my model, uh, I could make this look a whole lot better. Um, here's the GLES snippet. By the way, that was desktop array mode. Here's the GLES snippet, one triangle at a time. In this case, um, I'm able to, because I'm going to draw one triangle at a time, I can use the little three element, uh, the little three element arrays I have in each struct and give them as pointers to the, to the graphics device. I don't need to do any uh, concatenation into a great big array. That's left as an exercise for you, uh, not now. Um, so we've separated our code out. We have talked a little bit about what you need to do to convert direct mode to array mode operations in OpenGL ES. And now we need to talk about taking control. And this is the, the real iOS part of the talk. Um, and what I've put up here is a list of the typical GLUT handlers that, in this case, S2Plot uses. But almost any OpenGL program would use these handlers. There's a reshape. I'm going to go through them quickly. There's a reshape function, which handles the case when the user changes the size of the window on the screen. This doesn't happen very often on the um, iOS device. There's a display function which says um, this is the function to call when you need to draw. There's a visibility function which says this is the function to call when the window becomes visible or parts of the window are revealed. There's a keyboard function to handle keyboard input. There's an idle function. So if you're writing a, an OpenGL application that needs to do some processing but doesn't want to interfere with the interactivity, then you can use this idle function to do a little bit of the work at a time. So you do a bit of work and then release control back to the main loop. Um, my favorite is glut special func. I, I really want to write a, an API one day that has a function with, it's just called the special function. Um, this handles keyboard characters like F11 and home. So keyboard characters that aren't, don't have good ASCII representations. I mean, these days, glut would not be written like that. It would probably use UTF-8 encode, UTF encoding or something. Uh, there's the mouse function to handle the mouse uh, actions, so clicking buttons. There's motion to handle the mouse moving when there's a button down, and there's a different function to handle movement when the button is not down. One of those does not have an analog on the iOS device. So we'll get to that. So I, I said that this was sort of the hard bit. Or it's not the hard bit, it's, it's perhaps the fun bit. Um, because what happens is, well, there's no keyboard and there's no passive motion. So we won't worry about them. We can throw them away. Um, 
in parentheses there is a keyboard, of course. You can pop a keyboard up and the user could do something with it, but that I would class in the redesign of the input uh, category. So there's no keyboard and there's no passive motion. Passive motion is movement when there's no mouse button, when there's no, there's no mouse button down. And there's no analog of that. You have to touch the screen to get something to happen. Um, one could argue that accelerometers could fit in there, perhaps. But I think, again, that would be a change in the paradigm that you'd need to think about. So we've wiped out three. There's no keyboard funk, there's no special funk, and there's no passive motion funk. EAGL view that's given to you when you make a GL project for an OpenGL ES app in Xcode, uh, EAGL view looks after the layout. So there's no visibility function. Your app doesn't... There's sort of an analog to it, which is, you know, wake from sleep or wake from nib or something like this. But you don't need to worry about it. And there's certainly no reshape funk. What would be the equivalent of reshape? Yeah, rotating the device. And I, I think out of the box, the OpenGLES app looks after that for you. If it doesn't, um, it's quite easy to do. So how does it deal with layout for you? Um, well, you get this function written for you, pretty much. Um, some of the names might differ here because um, with each iteration of Xcode, the tem project template you get has some slightly different names in it. So you might see, in particular, self-draw view um, is probably draw frame if you make a project today. Uh, this is what layout subviews does, and it's called um, whenever the subviews need to be rearranged. So this would be on a rotation. So it sets the current context to this app and then it destroys the frame buffer and creates a new frame buffer. And the frame buffer is what you draw to. And when you draw, you can ask, what size is my frame buffer in pixels? And you can use that to give to viewport, GL viewport, which is the classic OpenGL way of saying, here's where I want to draw. So you can just, so in this layout subviews method, which is done for you, the frame buffer is recreated and then it asks your method to draw the view, which I think is called draw frame in the current project template. So rotation, um, if you enable it by saying, yes, it should auto-rotate, then layout subviews is called, and it does it all for you. Um, the only time you need to think about this is if you have user interface as well, overlaid over the top. And then you've got to do whatever you would do with the UI view controllers and UI views to get that right. And so the width and the height of the new frame buffers are stored in two local variables to this class that it makes for you. So your job is done. You call GL viewport and keep drawing. And so you can do this with almost no lines of code. So this is, uh, no, this is the smallest one in font size. This is the, uh, this is the create frame buffer method. Um, part of this is made for you, but if you want to do special things like uh, depth buffering, which is pretty standard, <laughs> Uh, or you want to do um, some rendering to textures, which so rendering to off-screen buffers that you're then going to use as textures, you might need to modify this function. In this case, I changed it because I wanted to use a depth buffer. The example it gives you, by the way, when you make an OpenGLES project, just draws a 2D square going up and down. It's not very 3D, so it doesn't need depth buffering. I personally think that depth buffering should be the default, um, I think there's now actually an initialization parameter, maybe. Does anyone know? I think there might be an initialization parameter that says you just want depth buffering by default. Uh, so that's what create frame buffer does. I suspect in the newer implementation, there's not a call to destroy and create. There's probably just a call to create, and it only calls destroy if it's, um, if it's currently in existence. So... Um, Display function and idle function were really traditionally on the desktop used to do animation. Um, EAGL view and view controller do this for you. They have, I hope I've got a slide on this. They have start animation, stop animation, and set animation interval. So you can ask for a frame rate. Um, it might not get it. If you try and draw seven squillion triangles, it won't be able to do 300 frames a second um, unless they're all off screen. Um, so you can start animation, stop animation, set the animation interval. So one thing you might like to do as a bit of extra is if the user rotates the device, before they rotate the device, stop the animation. And when they're finished rotating it, start the animation again. 
Um, if you're loading a new file with new geometry in it, you probably want to do that. Um, if you're popping up a user interface that's going to let them do something sophisticated, you might want to stop animation. <coughs> but in this case, you'd say, well, where's the idle bit gone? If I want to do some compute, if I want to gradually modify the model, say it's a, a, a wave, an ocean wave rippling or something under some particular function, you would actually do it in the draw function. When you're asked to draw, you can, um, you can do whatever you like there. So you might even spawn a thread to do that in the background or on another core. And the good thing is with the iPad 2, you do, you do have another core to play with. So <laughs> we've eliminated pretty much everything that glut we had to do with glut. A lot of it is done for us. And now we use EAGL view to handle touch events in the normal way. So I'm not going to cover how you handle touch events. That's pretty standard. Um, it's no different for the GL layer, except you might want to get the actual pixel coordinates so you can transform them into um, a sight line through your data if you want to see if, you've, if the user's touched some element of your geometry and behave differently. In the S2 plot case, um, once the model's on screen, the user touches to move the camera. So they, they touch, one, you know, single touch to spin around, uh, double touch to pinch, zoom, and rotate or roll. Um, but we do have um, part of the geometry in S2 plot, there's a particular geometry thing called a handle. And if you touch on that, it doesn't move the camera or anything. It starts sending callbacks to your code that you're moving a piece of, ge or you've touched a piece of geometry and you're now moving. And so you can respond to that by moving the piece of geometry, for example, in your model. Uh, right, this probably says what I just said. So <coughs> touch events are easy to replicate simple mouse things. Uh, Multi-touch gestures are good to implement because everyone who uses an iPad or an iOS device knows how to do this. And you use touches began, touches moved, and touches ended to, to do all of this. So I split the code up. And then uh, this is the new look code. Um, one might argue it looks a little bit messier because I'm not very good at diagrams. But it outlined in yellow is desktop S2 plot, and outlined in blue is what makes up iOS S2 plot. And they now share about, they share all the model view, all, all the model code. That's actually more than half of the code. The difference between direct mode OpenGL and array mode OpenGL ES is not actually great. It's an easy transition to do. You can do it watching telly. Um, you don't need to be sitting there sort of focused on it. It's, it's not difficult. Um, and the same goes for glue. So it's actually quite, quite possible. And again, I keep emphasizing you can just include s2plot.c in one of your .m files. So an obvious question here is what happens to my global variables? s2plot is a dumb C code that has squillions of global variables and global functions. Um, well, they just end up in the same global namespace. But it doesn't matter. Um, you might think, well, that, that would be bad, because what if a user wants to make two panes of the display with different geometry models in them? Well, S2plot supports that internally. So S2 plot, in S2 plot, you can break up your window into different panels and draw different geometry to them and have different callbacks for them and different lights and all of that stuff. So there didn't seem to be a whole lot of point re-implementing that in iOS because then the user doesn't have this thing where they can pick up their code for, in C from their main function and drop it into uh, the application delegate. So the fun bit is redesigning input. Once you've moved your existing app over to the over to iOS, you've now got a whole new ball game in terms of getting the user involved with what you're showing them. There's no keyboard and there's no passive, passive mouse input, but there's a, an amazingly rich and easy user interface kit. I mean, I, I even, it's even easy enough to just make up your own UI and code. I, I quite like Interface Builder. It has its ups and downs, but you, it's, it's easy enough to make your, your interface and code. Or, um, in our case, because we never introduced a user interface API or library and we never used glut for menus in S2plot, we wrote user interface using these handles I talked about. 
So we wrote user interface in OpenGL. In fact, one of, one of our summer students wrote a whole menu system using the S2 plot callback system, which I think was a, a long and difficult road for them. Um, and there has to be a balance somewhere in the middle. But if having done that, you can then pick that up and put it on the device and it works. Um, so UI view controller is, is your savior here. Uh, you can do anything. You can create, you can make yourself a little um, controller class that puts up a view, fills it with buttons, assigns selectors to them so that when they click, stuff happens. Give it the main um, view controller for the OpenGL canvas as the delegate. Uh, and it just starts calling selectors on that. Starts calling methods in your view controller, which modify the model or change the way it's being rendered. And so in the view did load of the UI view controller, you can make user interfaces to your heart's content. And then you just need to figure out a way to let the user tell you they want to see that user interface. And I, I choose to use something just like a, a triangle. This little triangle down here. Ooh. It is a triangle. Um, it probably looks more like a big red circle to you guys, but it is a triangle. And the user can just touch this. It says, oh, there's something here. The user just touches this and up pops a table view. Straight over the top, easy as pie. With, in this case, Dropbox files that I can click on, download, and visualize. And, and this sort of embodies why I'm doing what I'm doing at the moment, because I want the scientists who come and use our scanners at Monash Biomedical Imaging to be able to look on the, um, the radiographic display, say, yes, I like that image. I want that on my iPad. They save it in this format into their Dropbox, and they're done. So, um, so I did this by simply adding a view. Oh, this is the smallest one. Even I can't read this one. So in, this is application did finish launching. And this is where I set up a view controller. And I'll probably have some stuff that says, uh, I need to make a volume rendering of this particular file. So you might start, in this case, with a file on the device that's already there. And then um, if a particular private variable, which is a control view, this is a little controller I made, control and view, doesn't exist, I'm going to make a new one. And it has a, a button to let me log into Dropbox. And it has a table, table view. So if they're logged in, I fill out the table view. If they click the button, I let them log in. Uh, and this is sort of a self-contained user interface. I don't need to do anything more sophisticated in this case. Uh, but there's no reason you couldn't just pop up a view and put a, um, an exi a, a exib. I don't even know how to say it. I've never said it. Uh, a nib or a exib file uh, loaded into there. And the, in, in our case, we just use a user interface built in the, uh, app, in the API itself so that the user can have the same experience on the device as not. But other things, so like in, in S2Plot, or a common thing in any 3D package is to be able to auto-spin. In S2Plot, that was the A key, and we don't have a keyboard. So that was what we use. Oops. Back here. Oh. Somewhere way back here. This is, OK. So. Let's not, we'll go back to the start then. Just in case a few of you missed the start. This little panel down here has popped up from this side. And this lets me choose display modes. And in, in this case, I can choose mono or red, blue, red, green, red, cyan, stereoscopic. I can choose to have auto spin on or off. Um, this is an early version. I hadn't left room for auto spin to write. I can choose an orientation. I can lock the orientation of the iPad. So when I spin it around, nothing happens, nothing changes. Disclosure button, adding a view. Right, so um, to round this off, going back to S2Plot, what did we accomplish? Um, and um, was it a success? So the user can install S2Plot co code. Uh, there'll be a forthcoming code release. I'm not here to advertise it. I'm just saying this is what they can do. Uh, Desktop apps are written and compiled as usual. Simple C program. I mean, some people go to town and build a lot of code using S2Plot. They can install the S2Pad code, which we'd like to put out there, create a new target, and literally cut and paste the code from their desktop application. And hopefully, at some point, I'll find a way to just let them um, write that code with some 
uh, some preprocessor defines that let it, the same code, exactly the same code be compiled for each. Um, global functions just paste it in as well to global scope. And only application specific UI or interaction needs to be rewritten. Uh, here's a little suggestion of where you might start. I've sort of covered most of this, but uh, a, something I didn't talk about was how do you choose to use GLES 1 rather than 2. In the view controller awake from nib method that it gives you in the project, it'll let you, it tries to do a version 2. Um, and if that fails, it gives you a version 1. So you just change the version 2 assignment to nil rather than initializing it, and then it'll try and give you an ES1 uh, context, build and run on the iPad simulator, and then go through the rainbow of steps. Separate, migrate, replace, and redesign. This, and then the final dot point is sort of what I did. I started by um, shoving some GLES1 calls into the draw frame method just to check it was doing the right thing at the right time. I moved the geometry store over um, <coughs> once I'd separated all the code out. And then uh, you've got to remember to initialize your application state. So in, in S2Plot, there's, um, I, I would guess there's probably about 100 global variables, no one laugh, and um, they all need to be initialized um, in C. It's the right thing to do. So you have to remember to do that in your, um, in your iOS code as well. Uh, let's see, final hints and tips. So um, a lot of people use GL double for, uh, for OpenGL. It's pretty hard to justify that because pixels are fairly imprecise in a sense. And so GLES doesn't support GL double. So if you want to be able to draw directly, if you want to cast your um, vertex buffers from your model structure directly to something you can use on the card uh, in OpenGLES 1 or 2, you should use floats, not doubles. Otherwise, you've got, to come, you've got to go through a, a process of assigning, reassigning. The, a good place, I said this one, a good place for, for starting with glue is Mesa. Request the OpenGLES 1.1 pipeline. And um, the best sample code I've seen is an app called Molecules. It's open source. Uh, don't be scared off by the fact that it's scientific. What it does is it, draw, it pulls uh, proteins and molecules from the protein from places like the protein database and visualizes them these days it works in GLES 2 it's really beautiful um, but the code is available and the in particular the reason it's interesting is it handles all iOS screen sizes and rotations and you don't have to think about it um, so at some point I'm probably going to try and push that back into what I've been doing um, that'd be the end so I hope that's been useful. I'm happy to talk to people about these things um, and, and other things, visualization. So, uh, and I'm happy to take questions either now or by email or abuse. Um, keep it to a minimum. Uh, thanks.